I hope that the Wednesday night service is for your family what it is for mine. That's exactly what we need uh, right in the middle of the week. I've asked uh, Brother Bobby Bowser to come and preach tonight. He's an evangelist. He usually travels and has youth meetings. Of course, he doesn't just preach to the kids. Matter of fact, when he was here preaching to the kids this summer, um, the Lord convicted me and a couple of the other adults that were, that were in the services as well. That's, you know why? Because the Word of God is true. And it reaches us in every season, every station of life. I believe it was about a year ago that I first met Brother Bosler in person. Uh, we, um, around January 1st, right, we went and had breakfast uh, at a diner and began to pray about what the Lord uh, could and should and, and would have us to be part in doing uh, with the youth here. And, of course, that culminated in a wonderful, a wonderful summer uh, where we did reach out to the youth and we did see folks uh, come to salvation. And so thankful for the ministry, for the fruit, and uh, the labor that is put in. And, of course, Brother Bowser puts that, that labor in all, all, the way, all the way around the country and uh, in lots of different places. Uh, if you would, give us a little bit of report on the ministry, what's going on. Um, even uh, some, of the, some of the young men, those two young men that were with you there, and, and tell, us, tell us about what's going on with them. But have your Bibles open. If you come now, Brother Bowser, and uh, preach the word. Thank you, Brother. Yes, yes. All right, good evening. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces here, and uh, forgive me if I ask for your name again. Please forgive me. I've uh, seen a lot of faces and learned a lot of names since I was here back in April, um, but we, um, I am thrilled to be back here again. Uh, the two guys that you uh, met, Tim and Alex, you remember those guys? Uh, they have gone their separate ways, no longer a part of my team. I fired them. No. <laughs> Uh, they moved on, of course. Uh, Alex went back to school, and uh, he's doing great. In fact, it's been awesome to see uh, continuous answers to prayer for him. Uh, for those of you uh, that uh, were in tune with what we were sharing back in April, we had gone through some pretty significant vehicle trials uh, leading up into our meeting with our trailer. Of course, we were without our trailer when we were here and the thing that happened with the truck earlier on and we were praising the Lord for what God had done and Alex was there watching all of that. And it's just neat to me to see um, the Lord miraculously provided a vehicle for him uh, to come to school with and then a few weeks into the semester, with this new vehicle that God had provided for him, uh, the engine went bad in it. And uh, he told me the first thing I thought of was, what would, Miss, what would Brother Bosler do? Oh, that's right, I saw what he did. He trusted the Lord and God delivered him. And it was, it was very cool to see even there just deliverance for him. Uh, Tim is back home in Maine, and uh, he just bought a house, I believe, and he is faithful in his dad's church, and uh, he's a real blessing. Uh, this year for us has been quite an interesting year. In fact, uh, we were pretty sure when we were about here, as soon as we got our trailer back, uh, we would have all the major challenges and trials behind us. But that's not always how God works. Um, and in fact, many times God brings the challenges into our lives because he is getting us set up for something amazing and something great. And I've preached a lot on that this past year. And I had uh, either my wife or one of my team members, I don't remember which one, say, you got to stop preaching on that because the more you preach on that, the more the bad things happen and then God delivers. I'll, I don't want to bore you and I don't want to talk about myself here tonight. I want to get to the Bible. By the way, you can be turning to John chapter 1, which is where the text we're going to be looking at here this morning. But before I get to that, I will say that nice white truck uh, that we, uh, the Lord had newly provided, that Ram 3500 2019 uh, with a 6.7 liter uh, diesel engine. Uh, we had gotten down the road, that thing pulled our trailer, no sweat at all, and uh, we were driving up a hill in Missouri, and all of a sudden uh, we heard a bunch of loud beeps and everything, and the engine was overheating. I won't bore you with all the details except to say a couple weeks later, we ended up in a shop in Kansas, and uh, we thought it was a head gasket. They opened the thing up, and they said, you need, they called me up and said, you need to come in and look at this. And I came in, and they pointed inside of cylinder number six, and they said, your cylinder is shot. The engine is bad. It needs to be replaced. It's because of a few pre-existing things that we were not told about before we bought the vehicle. And he said, you're going to need a brand new engine on this truck, which will cost about $20,000. And by the way, if you get a brand new engine, which you're, it's impossible to get because of all the strikes going on, he said, uh, you uh, will instantly void the warranty by putting it into this truck because of some of the modifications that have been made to it prior to you getting the truck. 
And so I was looking at a total loss. And um, my wife and I, we didn't know what to do except wait on the Lord and seek his face. And um, what God did is uh, through a long, literally months of negotiation, prayer, and counsel, um, we were able to, after we ruled out legal action and different things like that, um, the dealer that we had bought it from actually coughed up uh, the Kelly Blue Book value of the truck. And uh, the Lord, even in addition to that, has been supplying uh, finances for it. And uh, I just, uh, about a month and a half ago, placed an order for a 2024 Ford F-350 with the 67 liter diesel, long bed, crew cab, uh, limited slip, axle, dual rear wheels, four by four, in case those of you guys that know that stuff and care about that kind of stuff, he's like, I don't know. Um, but we're very excited, thrilled with how the Lord has worked. It's been a huge trial of our faith, and uh, yet I have known, I, while I don't know, have, to know, have to know why, that's what the book of Job is all about. You don't have to know why. We can trust the Lord. And he will take care of every last need. And sometimes when the bad things happen, it's because God is actually trying to bless you in even greater ways. So I won't preach that. That's not my message. That's my testimony. But that's not my message here uh, this evening. If you could turn with me to the book of John in chapter number one, I want to take a look at a passage here that's going to bring up a question that I think is a very important question for us to grapple with. Um, here in John one, there's a ton of doctrine. Uh, during some of my off time during the fall semester, I teach a Bible doctrines class. And part of what I teach is I do teach uh, theology proper and also Trinitarian and in chapter 1 of John 1, uh, verse 1 of chapter 1 here, we find an amazing verse that is a very important verse for doctrine. Look at verse number 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same <clears throat> was in the beginning with God. Here we find this character, this individual, this thing that is identified here in this verse, this thing, this individual is the Word. The Word was with God in that he was somehow distinct from God, and yet the verse also tells us that he was God. Um, while I was teaching on Trinitarianism, did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say the word Trinity, and yet the concept of the Trinity is very clearly taught throughout Scripture. You see, in the Old Testament, it tells us that there is one called God, right? There is only one God. There is none else. And yet, there are three that are called God. Of course, the Father, we know the Son, very verses about the deity of Christ as being one of them and then the Holy Spirit as well. But here in this verse we find this beautiful mixture of distinction within the Godhead and yet the unity of the Godhead. One um, lecturer I listened to uh, um, said it very well. He said, all of us, we are one being, right? You are one being, each one of you. And each one of our singular beings have one person. In fact, we typically think of being as being synonymous with person. You are one being with one person. God is one being with three persons. Okay, We may not fully understand or grasp how that could be, and yet it is so. Again, the purpose of my message here is not to teach doctrine necessarily, but right here in this verse, it's clear there is someone who was distinct from God, and yet he was God. He has eternally existed. In fact, verse 3 makes that clear. It says, all things were made by him. And as if to underscore this concept, he sa says, and without him, the word was not anything made that was made. In other words, all that was created, all that had a moment of origin, a, a, a source, an originating source, came into being through this one called the Word. Again, I don't want to get into doc necessarily too much of church history and doctrine. There was this movement called Arianism way back in the early church, and there were people that said this was their little phrase. There was a time when the Son was not. That was their slogan, and they believed that Jesus was a created being, somehow inferior to God, his Father. And yet this verse right here says that all things were made by the Word. In fact, nothing that was made came into existence. 
through any other um, source other than the word. There is nothing. Uh, in other words, he wasn't made. <laughs> he did not come into existence at a point in time. He is eternal. So this is the word that we find here in this verse. It says in verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And really at the end of verse 5, we see a little bit of a preview of what I want to talk about here this evening. As we continue, he begins to talk about the forerunner of the word, um, that is John the Baptist. I'm not going to read all of the verses except to say that he was making it very clear here, this man, this man that was sent from God, this man whose name was John, he is not the word, he is not the light, the uh, quintessential light that I'm speaking of here. He merely came to bear testimony to that word, to that light. In verse 9, he gets back to speaking about Jesus again. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 10, and this is really where I'm getting getting to and where I'm, I'm wanting to focus on here this evening. It says, he, and the he that it's speaking of is the word. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He, that is the word, came unto his own, and his own received him not. In case there's any misunderstanding here tonight, I've got to make it clear. The word here in this passage is Jesus Christ, and him entering into the world is uh, the historical reference to those references is what we just celebrated that Uh, nativity, that entrance, that incarnation where Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the God who was with God, who was God, who created all things, this one who was the light of all men, became a human being. That's what we've been celebrating. I know you know the reason for the season here today. Um, In case um, you're not Sure, that's what this passage is talking about. I know you know that, but look down at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we find here the word came. He came. That's what Christmas is all about. But there's that verse in verse 11. When it says he came, he's talking about Christmas. But it says he came unto his own. I don't know if you all like to talk about the Greek or not, but I teach, teach Greek, actually, when I'm at home. Uh, October and November, I teach a course on Greek, third semester Greek. I love that kind of stuff. I'm a nerd. I am a nerd. Who would think that a teen evangelist would know, study, and teach Greek? But anyway, um, <clears throat> Interesting, when you study that verse here, when it says his own, there's an interesting thing here. The first time he says his own, it's actually in the neuter. And the idea of that is his own things or his own stuff. Jesus came unto his own things. And then it switches to masculine, his own ones did not receive him. The picture is amazing. It's unbelievable. It's like this. If you all were to uh, go out and buy a bunch of things, let's say Christmas presents or whatever, and you were to purchase those things, those things became your own possessions. And he's saying here he came unto his own possessions, the things that he made, the things that created, that he created, that literally derived their existence by his creative spoken word. He came unto his own stuff. And the things that belonged to him did not receive him. You know, uh, one of the ideas of that word receive is to welcome something. And what this verse is telling us is Jesus, the Son of God, the creator, the light of the world. When he came, he was unwelcome. And the question that I'm driving toward that I really want us to ask ourselves is why? 
Why was Jesus unwelcome? Why, when he came unto those who desperately needed his deliverance, why, when he came unto his own stuff, to his own people, to his own creation, why, when he came unto them, did he find an unwelcome reception? And I think when you answer that question, (laughs) I I think we're going to find a few applications that maybe show why sometimes he's not welcome in our own lives. You got to understand the background here. Prior to this moment, God had not spoken for 430 years. The last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, was the last time that God had inspired a human to write down God's words. It was the last time God had clearly spoken in a way that was intended for all man to benefit by. When Malachi was done being written, the heavens closed up. They did not hear directly from God for hundreds of years. In fact, some time if you read it it's not good for doctrine but it's great for history the 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 different letters to of the Maccabeans you find that they in those times they have no idea what God wants they have no idea they they speculate and they at times say well maybe we should do this well maybe we should do that and we find people who maybe have a uh, have a good desires and good goals and so on you find people just doing it on their own and here the silence is broken when the angel appeared unto Mary, when when the angel appeared unto her husband Joseph, when God broke the silence and began to speak, and when God came back, he found that unwelcome reception. Why? Why was he unwelcome? Why didn't his people rejoice? at the coming of Jesus. Let, let, me, let me make this statement. I, I want you to think about this. There, there is something, there's something different, and, and please don't read into this in, in the wrong way. I'm going to qualify here, so just, just hear me out for a second. There's something different about having God in a page in a book and having God in loving, living color standing right in front of you. Um, speaking to you directly, interacting with you. I I just got to make this clear. I'm not minimizing inspiration. This is God's authoritative word, okay? I'm not minimizing uh, the importance of what God has inspired, but I think we all know intuitively that if God were sitting on the back row of this auditorium, we would act different, right? 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 If God were in your home when you're talking to your family dads, you would probably talk to them differently. If God were looking over your shoulder when you're on your cell phone, you might do things a little differently, right? If God were in your car as you're driving to work, you might tune the radio or your phone a little differently. You follow what I'm saying? See, when God is silent, sometimes we end up acting like he isn't there, even though we have the inspired words right here in our laps. And what I'm saying is, for 430 years, God was absent, so to speak, though he was there in the words that he had inspired. Now, I know you may be thinking, well, but he's not absent, right? He is here. It is true where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. I am with you and shall be in you, Jesus said. Let not your hearts be troubled, right? I may be leaving, Jesus told his disciples, but I'm sending someone who will be one who stands in my place and dwells in you forever. I'm paraphrasing here. We know that the indwelling Holy Spirit that every one of us has by believing on Christ is the presence of God. We have God inside of us. I'm not minimizing any of those things whatsoever. Forgive me for all the disclaimers. I just never know what people are going to think when you say stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to cover all of my bases here. But it's true nonetheless that God had been absent. He had not spoken for hundreds of years. And I believe in that time of silence, in that time where God was not daily interacting with his people, where God was not speaking to them, where they had, yes, the words, but they could always take the words and do this to them, right? I believe Jesus' coming was a reminder 
Jesus' coming was a threat. Jesus' coming in some way, shape, or form upset the apple cart of how they were used to operating in the silence. There are three things that Jesus' coming did that I think is why he was unwelcome. Number one, his coming threatened their independent authority. Let me say that again. Jesus' coming threatened their independent authority. The name that comes to my mind is King Herod, right? Jesus was born kind of under the radar, so to speak, at least initially. Then you know what happened. We sing about it. We see things out there, even though technically it didn't happen like right at the time of his birth. But those wise men, right, they saw the star. They knew the prophecies. They journeyed across the Middle East from Asia to find this man, uh, this baby rather, that had come in fulfillment of prophecies that very likely had come from Daniel. I'm not going to get into all that, though. But they came and they came and they assumed that this baby who was supposed to be the king the scepter, right, that he would be at the palace. So they went to the palace and they found Herod there and they said, where's the baby? He said, what? <clears throat> right? What are you talking about? The new king. What new king? Oh, the one that was prophesied, the one the star says came. Where's the child? And you can see him stroking his beard and saying, tell me more about this new king, right? We find the words of Scripture tell us, when you find him, let me know where he is that I can come and also worship him. And <clears throat> what you find is he had no interest in worshiping him because as far as he was concerned, Jesus, his arrival as the king of Kings was a threat to his authority. See, when Jesus was announced by the wise men, the ruling administration instantly knew the implications of his arrival. A new king had come to rule. And their rule, his rule, was coming to a close. Let, let me say this. I, I think sometimes, and of course you know what he did, right? He lashed out. And when the wise men didn't come back to give him the specific details, he had all children under a certain age murdered. Violence. Violent retaliation. Why was that? It's because Jesus was a threat to his right to run the show. When God showed up and began speaking, when the presence of God was back in town, so to speak, it threatened their right to run their own kingdoms. See, often when God has been absent from your life for a time, you get used to operating on your own authority and making decisions based on your own desires. When God returns, however, he challenges who will sit on the throne of your life? His return is a reminder that he is God and we are not. And that we must bow the knee to his authority and relinquish our right to rule our own lives. Let me tell you this. Jesus didn't come to be your advisor. Jesus didn't come to be your counselor. He came to be your king. He didn't come to give you suggestions. He came to rule. And he came to rule you. When Jesus arrived to be the king of our lives and is not welcome. Listen, I want you to know, Christmas ought to remind you that Jesus came to run your life. I don't say that negatively. It is a very positive thing when you understand that he loves you. It's a very positive thing when you understand he knows the end from the beginning. You don't know tomorrow, but he does. You don't know what's coming down the pike, but he does. And if you'll let him run your life, if you'll let him call the shots, he's a much more efficient administrator than you are. But the problem is, is we want what we want. We don't want him to run the show, right? And when he comes, whether it's in a preaching service or when you open your Bible in the morning and say, God, speak to you, and he speaks to you, and you say, that's not what I wanted you to say, God. 
Or when God in a time of prayer puts upon your heart something he wants you to do or something he wants you to stop doing when he begins to exercise his rule by speaking to your spirit in your heart. And he finds an unwelcome reception. How do we respond? Um, Sometimes we lash out in anger against him like Herod did. I don't want to do that. Sorry. (laughs) Sometimes we try to pretend like he didn't really speak and just ignore him. You know, there's something about the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit is it's real easy to ignore. But God knows how to turn up the volume. Sometimes we like to dismiss his claim to rule. We like to say, you know, you really don't have jurisdiction here, God. Back off. Oh, oh, listen, you can, you can tell me what to do when it comes to church, but not in this area over here. And often what can happen is we relegate him to a safe little corner where he can control some, but not all of our lives. Jesus didn't come to rule a little corner of your life. He came to rule all of it. And that necessitates absolute surrender to God. I've been traveling, I've been preaching enough. It's not just the teens that need to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ, it's their moms and dads too. Amen. It's not just those attending, it's sometimes even those that lead churches, right, who need, have things in their lives, deacons, other leaders, trustees. Sometimes they are ones who need to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, this isn't my church to run, it's your church to run. I found myself in places where people like, they have preferences on how they think things want to be and they just love to push it instead of seeking the Lord and what he would have them do. You know, I, I know nothing, by the way, so I, I, don't, I don't know anything. Pastor hasn't told me anything, so if, there's, I, if the shoe fits the Holy Spirit, build it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, so I'm saying all that to say, listen, Jesus came to be your king. And we need to surrender completely and entirely to him. To him. You know, I'd like to say that not a day goes by, but that would be a bit of a stretch. That when I spend time with Jesus in the morning, I say, Lord, I really do want to do what you want me to do today. I want to be leadable today. I want you to correct me today. And you know, when he's practical, sometimes the Spirit of God will speak to your heart and say, stop working and get down and play with your kids. Sometimes he'll say, you need to apologize to your wife, you shouldn't have said it in that tone. Sometimes he'll tell you and he'll say, you know what, hey, listen, I really don't want you watching that that you program on Twitter that everybody's talking about. I Listen, they may be able to watch it, but I don't want you to watch it. He might say, hey, listen, I don't want you to listen to that podcast anymore. He may say, hey, I know you've been planning on watching that movie. I don't want you to watch that movie. He may say to you, it's not the time. I remember back earlier this fall, I um, there was a point in time where we had felt like, okay, uh, the Lord has clearly led. It's time to place an order for this truck. Um, we had money that had been given in addition to what was given back from the dealer, and we had enough for a really good down payment to a point where we could actually afford the payments and uh, I thought oh this is great Uh, the guy told me that we got to place the order by Wednesday it was Monday morning and so I got up that morning I'm having my devotions I like to type my prayers I don't know about anybody else it helps keep me focused and I have a record of what I talk to the Lord about I'm just telling you that's how I do it I'm typing my prayers out and it's like I said Lord I don't want to just take for granted that you want us to buy this truck and uh, I I really believe you do Um, but I just want to ask and make sure this is the right time and the right thing and I don't want to even though it's been so clear this is what you want us to do I want to give you an opportunity to speak and give your input and God said no and I said uh say what no wait well I'll be honest with you I was a little thrown by that I was like Lord are you sure <laughs> like what is this and um and I throughout the day I kind of kept coming back to my Bible and saying Lord what's, what's going on and the Lord led me to a psalm and there he talked about the miraculous provision of God for the children of Israel in the wilderness and how they even in the midst of God's miracles despised and disobeyed God and it was like God said to me 
Don't be that way. Don't think you got this thing behind you and now you can start being a little careless in the way you walk with me. Take warning from the children of Israel and don't play fast and loose in your relationship with me. And when throughout the rest of that day, there were a few other things I think the Lord wanted to tell me. And the next day I said, okay, Lord, how about now? And it's like the Lord said, do it, go for it. I don't understand. I don't totally understand, but here's the thing. You don't have to understand. You just need to obey. Amen. Does God still lead his people? Amen. Does God still take his words and apply it to our specific situations in our lives through the illumination of his Holy Spirit? Does he not still do that? Boy, I feel sorry for the churches and Christians that don't think he still does that. I'm not going to get into that, though, here. God speaks. He speaks. Listen, it's not on the level of revelation. This book is the only authoritative and errant revelation you're going to receive. But God loves to make his will clear to his children. And when he does, in our hearts, in our spirits, our obligation is to bow the knee. Because he didn't come to be your advisor. He came to be your king. Second reason why he was unwelcome when he came, not only did he threaten their independent authority, their right to rule their own lives, but secondly, he overturned their self-focused systems. The group of people that I'm thinking of here is the Pharisees. You know these people, right? These were the antagonists, the opponents to Jesus throughout the gospel accounts. These are the individuals, the religious leaders, who for some reason, though they were looking for their Messiah to come, when he did come, he was unwelcome to them. Why was he unwelcome to them? Well, they had developed their own rules and regulations for how life was supposed to be lived. And when you drill in to those rules and regulations, what you find is they had developed systems that benefited themselves and their own little group. See, when God shows up, however, he often overturns those systems in favor of his own. These individuals, listen, I'm not preaching against standards here tonight. Please don't misunderstand me. But I am telling you, there is a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. There is a outward godliness that belies the inward rottenness inside. And many times that disgusting discrepancy is propped up by self serving systems. See, these individuals in the name of godliness, holiness, and spirituality, they were self-serving, disobedient rebels at heart. You know, I, I think of one thing I, I studied when I took uh, Life of Christ in the Gospels, and that was this concept of Corbin. You ever study this? You ever look at this? So the Pharisees had this little thing set up where, um, you know, the law demanded that they take care of their parents. And so these Pharisees, these good-looking religious people, um, they would amass, you know, their own income and have their own little nest eggs. And what they would do is if they foresaw that their parents were going to be in need, they would take their money and they would let the synagogue use their money. And so their money at that time would be Corbin or dedicated or devoted. It would be tied up in the temple and therefore unavailable to take care of their parents. And when folks would say, well, hey, Liz, they'd say, Corbin, Corbin. Well, Jesus said, listen, if you don't honor your parents, let them die the death. And, and Listen, you claim to be so righteous and you scrupulously tithe every little bit of even the tiniest little things, but when it comes to taking your money and using it to do good for those that are your responsibility to do good by, you come up with a system that looks good on the outside. I'm giving it to God. But really is placed there purely 
to preserve your own right to do what you want to do with it. See, they look good on the outside, but inwardly, they were in it for themselves. They were called, Jesus called them whitewashed sepulchers, whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You see, their man-made rules and religious restrictions did not fulfill the heartbeat of God or the holiness of God. But instead, they gratified their own lust for power and control, their greed for gain and freedom to fulfill their own lusts while maintaining the veneer of religion. Listen, friends, I don't want to have a veneer of religion on the outside and to be a self-centered moron on the inside. And I don't want any system in my life that is going to serve me to stand. See, Jesus came. He saw right through those systems. He called them out. He, in fact, one of the reasons, at least the human reasons, why he was taken and nailed to the cross is because Jesus, his truth-telling, called the religious elites out on the carpet. They didn't like how it made them look. Listen, I am not arguing against being godly. I am not arguing against being conservative. I am not arguing against being holy. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. God says that we ought not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. I don't think we ought to look like the world, think like the world, talk like the world, sing like the world. I think we ought to be distinct from the world. But there's a difference between being distinct from the world and making stuff up to make you look good where you can be a pervert inside. You follow me? Jesus came to overturn those self-serving systems. See, they may not have been worshiping at, high, worshiping at high places like the unfaithful Israelites did in the Old Testament. You know that's why God sent the Babylonian captivity, right? Because they were worshiping other gods. They were unfaithful to God in their hearts. They learned from that. Right? These folks who said, oh, we love the Lord, yet they'd go and worship to Asherah or worship at the, the pole or whatever these things were that they would worship at, the high places they would worship, Baal. And God said, enough is enough. I'm punishing you. You're off to Babylon. You go. And what happened is the, the hearts that loved the Lord and the hearts that didn't became sifted in the land of Babylon. And when God finally gave the decree that they could head back through Cyrus, you can go back to the land. Those that had a heart for the Lord said, we'll go, we'll go. And those that didn't stayed. Again, I'm sure there was a mixture of that who actually turned, uh, and returned. But here's the thing. I believe Israel kind of learned their lesson. They learned you got to at least look spiritual on the outside. Can't serve other gods. See, while the Israelites, the mainstream religion of Jesus' day may not have been worshiping at high, pla high places or turning aside to graven images, they did have idols. They were not idols made by man out of stone or wood. They were idols made by man out of rules and regulations. <clears throat> See, their idols were of a different kind and were nonetheless even more sinister and deadly. In a craving for structure, they substituted their systems for their Savior, and when he came to set things in order, they sought to stone him. Listen, Jesus ought to be able to correct you at any time. He ought to be able to set you straight at any time. And when you get up in arms against Jesus for trying to set you straight in your heart, something is wrong. Let me, let me clarify and again just give a disclaimer here. He didn't come to bring anarchy, nor did he come to overturn true holiness. He came to bring his people back into alignment with his will, his heart, and his plan to bring the world to God. Jesus wanted the entire world to find salvation through faith in him. Pharisees were only interested in preserving their power and their system and their control over the people. So, why was Jesus unwelcome? Because he threatened 
their independent authority. He threatened their self-focused systems. And thirdly and finally, and I'll finish up with this here, he challenged their misfocused ideals. He challenged their misfocused ideals. When God is absent for a time, it's so easy to, uh, to get our priorities and purposes off center. You know, the Bible's full of a lot of stuff, a lot of statements, a lot of, uh, shall we say, philosophy for living. I'm not saying like philosophy in the sense of man-made philosophy, like we use it in a negative sense. But there is a lot that the scripture has to say about how life is to be lived. And the Bible keeps everything in balance because God is in balance. God wants us to win the world to Christ. God wants us to love our enemies. God does want us to be able to raise our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. God wants us to completely surrender to Jesus Christ and to go out and win the entire world to Christ. And you ever notice how all of those priorities seem to be at odds with each other sometimes? Right? And it almost seems like there's not enough time in a day to do all those things at one time. And what can happen is in an effort to fulfill any one of those ideals, they can go out of balance and we can get all about one of them and neglect the rest of them. And Jesus came to challenge us in our misfocused ideals. Listen, God is holy, but he's also love. God loves the world, but he's also going to send the world to hell if they don't trust Jesus. You get off on one side or the other, you'll end up in a ditch. Listen, God wants you to love your children, to spend time with your children. He wants you to invest in your home and make it a little slice of heaven here on this earth. But I meet people who say, I can't come to church because I'm trying to make my home a little slice of heaven. You know, God wants us to give everything we got to win the world to Jesus Christ. And yet I particularly feel the difficulty sometimes of trying to labor in a ministry full time and go out there and give it everything I got and still find time for my wife and kids. Amen. And that's important. That's important. <clears throat> Oftentimes, what can happen is we get fixated on one ideal and we forget about the rest of them. You say, Brother Basar, how can we properly balance those things? It's really not as hard as you might think. Just listen to Jesus. I can't give you a metric, right? Wouldn't that be nice? I did keto a couple years ago and you know you gotta very carefully balance out all of your macros, right? So many carbs, so many proteins, so many, whatever the other ones are. Um, fats, right, fats are the big one there, right? And uh, some of you know, some of you say, I wish I could forget that stuff. God, it's not like I can give you a proportion for how much time in your week ought to be spent for your family and how much time in your week ought to be spent in evangelism, how much time in your week ought to be spent for this, that, or the other thing. But what I can tell you is this, Jesus knows the proportion, and it's probably different every week, and God made it different every week so you'd stay close to Jesus every day of every week. See, when Jesus comes back, listen, I, 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 hmm, I'm not even going to get into it. Folks that are so out of balance, it just isn't even funny. And the thing is, is the balance isn't saying half for you, half for me, half for this, half for that. You don't have that many halves to go around. You've got to walk with Jesus. You gotta keep your ears open to that still small voice. You gotta be listening. Because when he speaks, he is probably going to challenge those misfocused ideals. Like I said earlier, we ought be correctable by God at any time. Like I said earlier, there have been times even here during this break where God said, stop working on that project. Get down on the floor and wrestle with your kids. There are some times where God might say to you, turn off the TV and spend time in your Bible. There might be times where God says, I know you set this evening aside to play board games, but I want you to spend, have a prayer meeting, praying for some people to get saved, or maybe some afternoon you plan to nap in. And God said, I want you to go talk to your neighbor. Tell them about Jesus. Give them a tract. 
I'm not saying it's always that you're never going to get a nap in. Some of you are thinking, I know where he's leading. I'm never going to get a nap ever, ever again. No. Sometimes God will lead you to take a nap. Sometimes God will lead you to take a vacation. Sometimes God will lead you to take some time off. Jesus took time off. And yet, when the multitude followed him, and God made it clear, go for it, son. Even when it messed up his plan and his time off, he ministered. He ministered. See, Jesus challenges our misfocused ideals. When God is silent for a time, our thinking becomes uncorrected and our aspirations become misfocused. But when Jesus comes onto the scene, he seeks to realign our thinking and our ideals with reality by challenging them. Oftentimes, his challenges go unheeded or unappreciated. Sometimes we explain them away because they don't understand. But our responsibility is to say, yes, sir. I want you to think, listen, um, Jesus had quite an interesting cast of characters in his disciples, right? All of them with different personalities. All of them with different goals, very likely for following Jesus. Some of them probably wanted revolution. Some of them wanted this. Some of them wanted that. And you know what? Jesus made it very clear to all of them in Acts chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. But one of them said, is it time for the kingdom? Is it time for the kingdom? Is it time when you're going to bust Roman heads together and set up a kingdom here on this earth? We've been hoping you would say it's time. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? And he said, none of your business. None of your business. Don't you worry about that. But I do have something I want you to concern, be concerned with. I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait. Wait? We didn't sign up to wait. We signed up to act. I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait. You're going to receive the most important asset and partnership that you will ever receive as my disciple. And then, when you have received power from the Holy Spirit, then I want you to be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem then in Judea, then in Samaria, and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. See, they were so fixated on the kingdom, they weren't thinking about Jesus' mission. Listen, the kingdom's coming, and I'm looking forward to it. There are all kinds of ways in which God wants us to be involved here today, and yet our greatest responsibility is to listen to Jesus. He'll tell you what to do. He'll tell you where to be involved. He'll tell you how to act. He'll tell you how your life ought to be prioritized. I cannot tell you that. Your pastor cannot tell you that. Your parents cannot tell you that. Oh, they can give you a good idea, young people. You need to obey your parents and the Lord for this is right, okay? God has given your pastor to care for your souls. He's going to give an account for you. You better listen to what he has to say. And yet, no man knows how every nook and cranny of your week is supposed to be prioritized but the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. He didn't come to be your advisor. He came to be your king. He came to challenge those systems that we have in place that serve ourselves and leave our inside rotten. And he came to challenge the misfocused ideals that silence produces as we get off center in our pursuit of God and his will. So how am I going to boil this all down, okay? Have you found that there may be some areas in your life where maybe... Jesus might have been just a little bit unwelcome. Areas, perhaps, where you just didn't want him to tell you what to do. Maybe areas where you found yourself out of balance and haven't talked to him about how to properly be in balance. My challenge to you here tonight is this. The greatest thing you could ever do is to bow the knee before Jesus and say, Jesus, my life is yours. I am going... I am completely surrendering to your kingship in my life, to your input, to your correction. I open myself up to you, God, and I want you to tell me how to live. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed here tonight? I just want to ask this simple question here. I know it's Wednesday night. It's not probably your usual kind of a close. I have no idea how you usually close on Wednesday night. But I want to ask you this question. How many of you here tonight would say, you know what, I was challenged in some way, shape, or form here tonight about this matter of 
Jesus' unwelcome return. And I have to say, I may have found some areas in my life where I've not welcomed his kingship. There may be some areas in my life where I've not been willing for him to correct my self-focused systems. There have been some areas perhaps where I've not allowed him to balance those misfocused ideals. And I want in my heart to let Jesus be God in my life. God has spoken to me here tonight. He's broken the silence in my life and he has put his finger on at least one area. If that's you, may I see your hand? I'd love to pray for you here tonight. Amen. Many hands. Praise the Lord. Here's what I'd like to do. If we could all please stand here at this time. Go ahead and stand where you're at. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. If God has spoken to you in a specific way, I want to urge you, don't just let... Don't just let this become a fleeting thought in the back of your mind that you lose when you walk out of this room. Before we start to talk to each other and and fellowship, before we leave this building, I want to urge you, in a moment the piano is going to play, and when it does, I want to call you to actually tell Jesus in your heart, I am making you my king. I am giving you the right to call the shots and to tell me what to do. I want to be completely surrendered to you. Whether you do that in your seat or whether you come forward and kneel in front of these stairs and tell him here, I don't care where you go, but what I do care is that you bow the knee in your heart to Jesus. As the piano plays, you do business with him. I'd like to ask you to continue in the spirit of prayer as you do. I'm going to sing the words to this song. We've been challenged tonight. What a challenging question. Would, would the Lord be welcome in your own heart and life if he showed up and said, I'm here to take charge. I'm here to be in control. I'm going to realign your priorities, help you know what to do. Challenge those things. Would we be willing to submit to it? As uh, you continue to pray, I'm going to sing the Beautiful words to this song, invitational song. Open my eyes, what a wonderful prayer. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit, deep If you're going to continue to pray, you can. If you'd like to join me, I'd like to invite you to sing and and sing it uh, as it's meant to be sung. This is a a song of prayer, asking God for him to show you his will, for you to see him. Really, there couldn't be a better invitation hymn uh, than this one tonight with the message.
Let's go ahead and sing it together on the second verse. Open my ears that I That's the prayer of your heart. On the way home, uh, me and the children were talking about a message we had heard uh, when we were visiting another church down in Tennessee. And uh, I was actually, uh, we mentioned the, the, the story there, Herod and the, the apathetic priests and all that. And I, I said to the kids, I said, what do you think that they had that was so important in their lives that they didn't go with the wise men? Like, what was it? And what kind of regrets do you think they had now? Like, that they didn't do that. I said, you know, uh, when we let God lead, we don't have those regrets. When we welcome him, those things go away because we've been following him the whole time. And uh, very, very thankful for the message tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Bosser. Make sure you, you greet him and thank him for, for the good preaching. I'm glad that you've been here tonight. Uh, how many of you are glad you're saved tonight? Would you say amen? amen. amen. I'm mean, glad to be challenged by the word. Would you say amen? I'm so glad. And uh, please be in your places. Remember this. If you've not yet signed up for the watch night service, please sign up. Uh, just to make sure we have enough food. And so this Sunday night, our service is not at 5 like normal. Our service pushed back to start at 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll begin with a, with a meal together and uh, some, uh, some, some fun games. We have uh, Brother Justin Kassam is going to be preaching on that Sunday night. And uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful time praying in the new year. And so uh, make sure you sign up for it. Be in your places. And uh, God bless you. Let's close in a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word and the challenge of it here tonight. Lord, I pray that, that our hearts truly would be a, a welcome place uh, for your authority, for your challenges. Uh, Lord, all of your leading and guiding. We, we thank you that you do offer these things. I pray that we'd be ready to receive them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here. God bless you. You are dismissed. Amen.